3. God's revelation of himself to man. In God's actual revelation of himself and certain of these relations. As we do not in this place attempt a positive proof of God's existence or of man's capacity for the knowledge of God, so we do not now attempt to prove that God has brought himself into contact with man's mind by revelation. We shall consider the grounds of this belief hereafter. Our aim at present is simply to show that, granting the fact of revelation, a scientific theology is possible. This has been denied upon the following grounds. A. That revelation, as a making known, is necessarily internal and subjective, either a mode of intelligence, or a quickening of man's cognitive powers, and hence can furnish no objective facts such as constitute the proper material for science. Morel, Philos, Religion, 128131, 143. The Bible cannot in strict accuracy of language be called a revelation, since a revelation always implies an actual process of intelligence in a living mind. F. W. Newman, Phases of Faith, 152, of our moral and spiritual God we know nothing without, everything within. Theodore Parker, verbal revelation can never communicate a simple idea like that of God, justice, love, religion. See Review of Parker in Bib Sac, 18 2427. James Martino, Seat of Authority in Religion, as many minds as there are that know God at first hand, so many revealing acts there have been, and as many as know him at second hand are strangers to revelation, so, assuming external revelation to be impossible, Martino subjects all the proofs of such revelation to unfair destructive criticism. Flydra, Philos, Religion, 1 185, as all revelation is originally an inner living experience, the springing up of religious truth in the heart, no external. Event can belong in itself to revelation, no matter whether it be naturally or supernaturally brought about. Professor George M. Forbes, nothing can be revealed to us which we do not grasp with our reason. It follows that, so far as reason acts normally, it is a part of revelation. Ritchie, Darwin, and Hegel, 30, the revelation of God is the growth of the idea of God. In reply to this objection, urged mainly by idealists in philosophy, a, we grant that revelation, to be effective, must be the means of inducing a new mode of intelligence, or in other words, must be understood. We grant that this understanding of divine things is impossible without a quickening of man's cognitive powers. We grant, moreover, that revelation, when originally imparted, was often internal and subjective. Matheson, Moments on the Mount, 5153, on Galatians 1 verse 16, to reveal his son in me. The revelation on the way to Damascus would not have enlightened Paul had it been merely a vision to his eye. Nothing can be revealed to us which has not been revealed in us. The eye does not see the beauty of the landscape, nor the ear hear the beauty of music. So flesh and blood do not reveal Christ to us. Without the teaching of the Spirit, the external facts will be only like the letters of a book to a child that cannot read. We may say with Channing, I am more sure that my rational nature is from God, than that any book is the expression of his will. b. But we deny that external revelation is therefore useless or impossible. Even if religious ideas sprang wholly from within, an external revelation might stir up the dormant powers of the mind. Religious ideas, however, do not spring wholly from within. External revelation can impart them. Man can reveal himself to man by external communications, and, if God has equal power with man, God can reveal himself to man in like manner. Rogers, in his Eclipse of Faith, asks pointedly, if Messrs. Morel and Newman can teach by a book, cannot God do the same? Lots, Microcosmos, 2 660, Book 9, Chapter 4, speaks of revelation as either contained in some divine act of historic occurrence, or continually repeated in men's hearts. But in fact there is no alternative here, the strength of the Christian creed is that God's revelation is both external and internal. See Gore, in Lux Mundi, 338. Rainey, in Critical Review, 1 121, well says that Martino unwarrantably isolates the witness of God to the individual soul. The inward needs to be combined with the outward, in order to make sure that it is not a vagary of the imagination. We need to distinguish God's revelations from our own fancies. Hence, before giving the internal, God commonly gives us the external, as a standard by which to try our impressions. We are finite and sinful, and we need authority. 
the external revelation commends itself as authoritative to the heart which recognizes its own spiritual needs. External authority evokes the inward witness and gives added clearness to it, but only historical revelation furnishes indubitable proof that God is love, and gives us assurance that our longings after God are not in vain. See, hence God's revelation may be, and, as we shall hereafter see, it is, in great part, an external revelation in works and words. The universe is a revelation of God, God's works in nature precede God's words in history. We claim, moreover, that, in many cases where truth was originally communicated internally, the same spirit who communicated it has brought about an external record of it, so that the internal revelation might be handed down to others than those who first received it. We must not limit revelation to the scriptures. The eternal word antedated the written word, and through the eternal word God is made known in nature and in history. Internal revelation is preceded by, and conditioned upon, external revelation. In point of time earth comes before man, and sensation before perception. Action best expresses character, and historic revelation is more by deeds than by words. Dorna, hist prot theol, 1 231 in 264, the word is not in the scriptures alone. The whole creation reveals the word. In nature God shows his power, in incarnation his grace and truth. Scripture testifies of these, but scripture is not the essential word. The scripture is truly apprehended and appropriated when in it and through it we see the living and present Christ. It does not bind men to itself alone, but it points them to the Christ of whom it testifies. Christ is the authority. In the scriptures he points us to himself and demands our faith in him. This faith, once begotten, leads us to new appropriation of scripture, but also to new criticism of scripture. We find Christ more and more in Scripture, and yet we judge Scripture more and more by the standard which we find in Christ. Newman Smith, Christian Ethics, 7182, there is but one. Authority, Christ. His Spirit works in many ways, but chiefly in two, first, the inspiration of the Scriptures, and, secondly, the leading of the Church into the truth. The latter is not to be isolated or separated from the former. Scripture is law to the Christian consciousness, and Christian consciousness in time becomes law to the Scripture, interpreting, criticizing, verifying it. The Word and the Spirit answer to each other. Scripture and faith are coordinate. Protestantism has exaggerated the first, Romanism the second. Martino fails to grasp the coordination of Scripture and faith. D. With this external record we shall also see that there is given under proper conditions a special influence of God's Spirit, so to quicken our cognitive powers that the external record reproduces in our minds the ideas with which the minds of the writers, were at first divinely filled. We may illustrate the need of internal revelation from Egyptology, which is impossible so long as the external revelation in the hieroglyphics is uninterpreted, from the ticking of the clock in a dark room, where only the lit candle enables us to tell the time from the landscape spread out around the Rigi in Switzerland, invisible until the first rays of the sun touch the snowy mountain peaks. External revelation, Rom. 119, 20, must be supplemented by internal revelation, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 10 and 12. Christ is the organ of external, the Holy Spirit the organ of internal, revelation. In Christ, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, are, the yeah, and the Amen, the objective certainty and the subjective certitude, the reality and the realization. Objective certainty must become subjective certitude in order to be a scientific theology. Before conversion we have the first, the external truth of Christ, only at conversion and after conversion do we have the second, Christ formed in us, Galatians 4 verse 19. We have objective revelation at Sinai, Exodus 20 verse 22. Subjective revelation in Elisha's knowledge of Gehazi, 2K, 526. James Russell Lowell, Winter Evening Hymn to My Fire, Therefore with thee I love to read our brave old poets, at thy touch how stirs life in the withered words. How swift recede time's shadows. And how glows again through its dead mass the incandescent verse, as when upon the anvil of the brain it glittering lay, cyclopically wrought by the fast throbbing hammers of the poet's thought. E. Internal revelations thus recorded, and external revelations thus interpreted, 
both furnish objective facts which may serve as proper material for science. Although revelation in its widest sense may include, and as constituting the ground of the possibility of theology does include, both insight and illumination, it may also be used to denote simply a provision of the external means of knowledge, and theology has to do with inward revelations only as they are expressed in, or as they agree with, this objective standard. We have here suggested the vast scope and yet the insuperable limitations of theology. So far as God is revealed, whether in nature, history, conscience, or scripture, theology may find material for its structure. Since Christ is not simply the incarnate Son of God but also the eternal Word, the only revealer of God, there is no theology apart from Christ, and all theology is Christian theology. Nature and history are but the dimmer and more general disclosures of the divine being, of which the cross is the culmination and the key. God does not intentionally conceal himself. He wishes to be known. He reveals himself at all times just as fully as the capacity of his creatures will permit. The infantile intellect cannot understand God's boundlessness, nor can the perverse disposition understand God's disinterested affection. Yet all truth is in Christ and is open to discovery by the prepared mind and heart. The infinite one, so far as he is unrevealed, is certainly unknowable to the finite. But the infinite one, so far as he manifests himself, is knowable. This suggests the meaning of the declarations, John 1 verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, 14 to 9, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, 1 Tim. 6 16, Whom no man hath seen, nor can see. We therefore approve of the definition of Kaftan, dogmatic, 1. Dogmatics is the science of the Christian truth which is believed and acknowledged in the Church upon the ground of the divine revelation, in so far as it limits the scope of theology to truth revealed by God and apprehended by faith. But theology presupposes both God's external and God's internal revelations, and these, as we shall see, include nature, history, conscience and scripture. On the whole subject, see Carney's, Dogmatic, 3 3743, Nietzsche, System Christ. Docked, 72, Luthard. Fund. Truths, 193, Orbelin, Division Reverend, Introd, 29, Martino, Essays, 1 171, 280, Bibsac, 1867 593, and 1872 428, Porter, Human Intellect, 373375, C. M. Mead, in Boston Lectures, 1871 58. B. That many of the truths thus revealed are too indefinite to constitute the material for science, because they belong to the region of the feelings, because they are beyond our full understanding, or because they are destitute of orderly arrangement. We reply. A. Theology has to do with subjective feelings only as they can be defined, and shown to be effects of objective truth upon the mind. They are not more obscure than other facts of morals or of psychology and the same objection which would exclude such feelings from theology would make these latter sciences impossible. See Jacobi and Schleiermacher, who regard theology as a mere account of devout Christian feelings, the grounding of which in objective historical facts is a matter of comparative indifference, Hagenbach, His Doctrine, 2 401403. Schleiermacher therefore called his system of theology, De Christlich Glaube, and many since his time have called their systems by the name of, Glaubenslayer. Rituals, value judgments, in like manner, render theology a merely subjective science, if any subjective science is possible. Kaftan improves upon ritual, by granting that we know, not only Christian feelings, but also Christian facts. Theology is the science of God, and not simply the science of faith. Allied to the view already mentioned is that of Feuerbach, to whom religion is a matter of subjective fancy, and that of Tyndall. Who would remit theology to the region of vague feeling and aspiration, but would exclude it from the realm of science? See Feuerbach, Essence of Christianity, translated by Marion Evans, George Eliot, also Tyndall, Belfast Address. b. Those facts of revelation which are beyond our full understanding may, like the nebula hypothesis in astronomy, the atomic theory in chemistry, or the doctrine of evolution in biology, furnish a principle of union between great classes of other facts otherwise irreconcilable. We may define our concepts of God, and even of the Trinity, at least sufficiently to distinguish them from all other concepts, and whatever difficulty may encumber the putting of them into language only shows the importance of attempting it.
and the value of even an approximate success. Horace Bushnell, theology can never be a science, on account of the infirmities of language. But this principle would render void both ethical and political science. Fisher, National and Meth. Of Revelation, 145, Hume and Gibbon refer to faith as something too sacred to rest on proof. Thus religious beliefs are made to hang in mid-air, without any support. But the foundation of these beliefs is no less solid for the reason that empirical tests are not applicable to them. The data on which they rest are real, and the inferences from the data are fairly drawn. Hodgson indeed pours contempt on the whole intuitional method by saying, whatever you are totally ignorant of, assert to be the explanation of everything else. Yet he would probably grant that he begins his investigations by assuming his own existence. The doctrine of the Trinity is not wholly comprehensible by us, and we accept it at the first upon the testimony of Scripture. The full proof of it is found in the fact that each successive doctrine of theology is bound up with it, and with it stands or falls. The Trinity is rational because it explains Christian experience as well as Christian doctrine. See, even though there were no orderly arrangement of these facts, either in nature or in scripture, an accurate systematizing of them by the human mind would not therefore be proved impossible, unless a principle were assumed which would show all physical science to be equally impossible. Astronomy and geology are constructed by putting together multitudinous facts which at first sight seem to have no order. So with theology. And yet, although revelation does not present to us a dogmatic system ready-made, a dogmatic system is not only implicitly contained therein, but parts of the system are wrought out in the epistles of the New Testament, as for example in Rom 5 colon 1219, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, 8 verse 6, 1 Tim. 316, Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2. We may illustrate the construction of theology from the dissected map, two pieces of which a father puts together, leaving his child to put together the rest. Or we may illustrate from the physical universe, which to the unthinking reveals little of its order. Nature makes no fences. One thing seems to glide into another. It is man's business to distinguish and classify and combine. Origen, God gives us truth in single threads, which we must weave into a finished texture. Andrew Fuller said of the doctrines of theology that, they are united together like chain shot, so that, whichever one enters the heart, the others must certainly follow. George Herbert, oh that I knew how all thy lights combine, and the configuration of their glory, seeing not only how each verse doth shine, but all the constellations of the story. Scripture hints at the possibilities of combination, in Rom 5 1219 with its grouping of the facts of sin and salvation about the two persons, Adam and Christ, in Rom. For 24, 25, with its linking of the resurrection of Christ and our justification, in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 6, with its indication of the relations between the Father and Christ, in 1 Tim. 3 16, with its poetical summary of the facts of redemption, see commentaries of Dewet, Maya, Fairben, in Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2, with its statement of the first principles of the Christian faith. God's furnishing of concrete facts in theology, which we ourselves are left to systematize, is in complete accordance with his method of procedure with regard to the development of other sciences. See Martino, Essays, 129, 40, um. Theol, Reverend, 1859, 101126, Art. On the idea, sources, and uses of Christian theology.